the sexiest man in Hollywood. That's right, we're getting straight into it today, ladies and gentlemen. So, who is it we're talking about today? Well, it's this guy, and damn, he's a good-looking fella. But, can you be too sexy for your own good? Hello! Welcome to Brain Spill, the laziest show on the internet. My name is Tank, and the man we're talking about today is this guy. He is called Seisu Hayakawa. A name which I 100% totally nailed. No translation issues whatsoever. I'm pretty sure. A Japanese actor who would rise to fame in the eras of 1910s to the 1920s, Hayakawa would become the first actor of Asian descent to achieve fame as a leading man in American and European cinema, breaking into the West and becoming a very popular star amongst Hollywood's silent film era. This would all begin on a vacation he had when he travelled from Japan and went over to Los Angeles, in particular to Little Tokyo in a Japanese acting studio where he was doing it just to pass the time. While at the Japanese Playhouse, they were doing a stage production called Typhoon, where the producer at the time, obviously too stunned by this man's smouldering looks, offered him a role in the production. But one thing to note here was that Hayakawa was, like I said, on vacation and he wasn't really here to work. So in order to let the guy down easy, he said that he would do it for the small price of a weekly salary of $500. Now you have to remember that this is the year 1914 and $500 then was about $5,000 today. So that is an awful lot of money to be paying out just for coming to some acting gig. I mean, hell, if I was acting and someone was going to pay me $5,000 a week, then, then you bet your ass I'm going to do the exact same thing. And despite the fact that he had no intention of doing this and wanted to let the guy down easy, the producer said, yeah, sure, I'll pay you that. So like any sane person would, he decided to take the offer. And this would be the first step in Hayakawa's very illustrious acting career. Upon the release of this play and the subsequent silent movies on film, Hayakawa would go on to star in a number of projects with an increased salary to which he would very soon partner with Paramount Pictures. In his second film for Paramount, The Cheat, directed by Cecil B. DeMille, Hayakawa played a predatory Japanese art dealer who burns a brand on the shoulder of leading lady Fanny Mae. This villainous but seductive role was the thing that would truly cement him in Hollywood and he would be known as the guy to go to if you needed a character in a production quite like this. This was sort of his go-to role if this was anything that he was going to play. Hayakawa would be so successful that he would even make enough money to be able to own a property on the corner of Franklin Avenue and Argyle Street that looked like a castle for crying out loud. Just because he could. And yes, whilst he could live the high life, he even drove a gold-plated car around, to which, if he was bored, he could just drive home to his castle. It's crazy to think how rich this guy must have been to be able to afford all this stuff. All from pretty much falling into a job when he was on vacation. Despite his early roaring success, things would not always go so peachy, in particular for the next few years for the actor. During the height of his career, American public opinion on the Japanese was tending to go on the more disliked side of history. And that the sexiest man in Hollywood would soon become cooked by Hollywood itself. Now, the real problem here, and I ain't gonna sugarcoat it, the Hollywood execs at the time were pretty damn racist. And basically, they didn't want to make a production where a Japanese man would be the hero at the end of the day. Meaning that every time Hayakawa was cast into a role, it would always be more on the villainous side. Meaning that, despite being pretty much the most single attractive man on the entire production, he would never get the girl at the end of the show. Because of course not. Any true-blooded American knows that the American always has to come out on top. Because that is the American way. Yes, despite being the guy who every man wanted to be and every woman wanted to be with, with some crossover of course, Hayakawa would always be put in the box where he was always placed into a role of a villain, which means that he never actually got to act in some of the roles that he really wanted to do, mainly because of public opinion and those Hollywood execs at the time. Yes, he would forever be cast as the forbidden love interest. He was never quite able to get the girl, and this happened in more than 20 films that Hayakawa made with Paramount Pictures. 
he was typecast as the exotic lover or villain, forced to relinquish the heroine in the last act. So close, but so far. To be fair to Hayakawa, he did have a very good career, and if you're feeling sorry for the guy, just remember that this is the man that owns a castle and drives a gold-plated car, so yeah, don't feel too bad for him. What's even more bonkers about this whole thing is that he was a very good actor and very well respected amongst his peers. It was pretty much those Hollywood execs who were clearly very emasculated by the fact that this man was so goddamn handsome. This would eventually lead to a decision by Hayakawa, once his contract with Paramount expired in 1918, to start his own production company. He borrowed $1 million from a former classmate at the University of Chicago and formed Hayworth Films in 1918, with offices on the corner of Sunset and Hollywood Boulevards. Over the next three years, he pumped out 23 films and made approximately $2 million a year. So yes, despite being tarnished with a arguably very racist brush, he managed to come out on top and made a very successful business which was even able to run in tandem with many of the biggest productions in Hollywood at the time. And yes, whilst unfortunately a lot of these stereotypes held in the West for quite a long time against Japanese people, he would continue to go on to make many great films and star in many productions. Most people would probably recognise Hayakawa from his role as the honourable villain, Colonel Sato, who received an Academy Award nomination for his role in the 1957 film, The Bridge Over the River Kwai. These stereotypes and preconceived notions about Japanese people would hold for quite a long time, until shortly after the end of the Second World War. And that was good and all, but for Hayakawa this almost seemed to be too little too late, and if he was around in Hollywood just a few years later, he might not have been put down quite so bad. But I know one thing for sure, he was way too damn handsome for anyone to really care about it, and I'm pretty sure he knew that as well. If you liked the video, be sure to like and subscribe. If you want to be notified as soon as I upload my next video, be sure to hit the bell button. And if you've got any ideas for what topics you'd like me to discuss next, let me know down in the comments below. As always, sources used in the video will be in the description. Yes, unfortunately, Hayakawa never got that role that he always wanted to be the hero on screen at the end of the day. And although that never happened, I don't think it's too much of a miss because we all know secretly deep down that the villain roles are always the most interesting of all. So yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. Fantastic.